Over the past eight years, I've published hundreds of tutorials and videos about Affinity Photo. I've also written multiple books and courses helping photographers master the software. So when the new Affinity software was announced, my inbox exploded with emails asking for my thoughts. There are so many questions I simply can't reply to everyone. That's why I'm making this video to give my honest take on what's good, what's bad and what's downright ugly about Affinity 3. Let's start with the good. We'll start with the biggest news here, which is Affinity is now free. That's what's capturing all the headlines. That instantly makes it a strong alternative for anyone who doesn't want to pay through Adobe's subscriptions. If you've been looking for a capable professional suite without the ongoing costs, Affinity is worth serious consideration. But it does come with a few caveats, which I'll come back to later. The next thing I really like is the new Bloom filter. Let's add it to this image so you can see what it does. I'm working in the Pixel Studio, which is where all the image editing happens. Most of the editing tools here behave just as they did in Affinity Photo, but the menu system has been reorganized. Many options that used to appear under separate menus like filters and layers are now grouped into a single pixel menu at the top. The filter menu, for example, is now found under Pixels, Filters, and you'll find the Live Filter layers are available from Pixels under the new Live Filter section. So, if you're used to the old layout and you can't find something, check the Pixel menu first. Personally, I think this is a weakness in some ways, but we'll discuss that later. To apply the Bloom effect for this example, we'll use a Live Filter layer. That's available from the new Live Filter option in the Pixel menu. When added, you'll see the new filter appear in the Layers panel on the right, just as you would expect with Affinity Photo. We also see the Filter dialog where you can adjust how it affects the highlights, midtones and shadows using simple sliders. It's a powerful effect that's useful for adding glow and atmosphere to your images, especially in the highlights. And of course, you can still use masks or the blend options to control exactly where it's applied. The Affinity interface also has a few nice improvements over Affinity Photo 2. One that I think will be helpful for new users is the floating subtools palette. When you click on a tool icon, any related tools appear together in a small group palette. That makes it easier to find what you need and keeps the main tools palette tidy. But if you prefer the old layout, you can right click on the tools palette and choose to hide the sub palette. Then you can expand tool groups manually by clicking on the small icon in the corner, just as you would have. Overall, these are the main things that I think the new Affinity software does well. The software retains the power of Affinity Photo in a modern interface, adds a few nice features and it's free. But as with any big update, not everything hits the mark. Let's move on to what I think is bad about the new software. The level of customization in the new interface is possibly too much and I think it will cause confusion for many new users. For example, the old confusing personas are gone, but we now have studios in the place and there's more of them. You can see these are organized along the top left of the screen. The first three seem to have resulted from combining three applications into the new Affinity software. The Vector Studio is like the old Affinity Designer, Pixel is like Affinity Photo and Layout is like Affinity Publisher. We then have the Slice Studio, which seems to be the old export persona. And after that, we have four new studios. The first is Canva AI, containing the generative AI subscription tools. I'll have more to say about that shortly. Then we have the retouching, colour grading and compositing studios. If you're a photographer and only using Affinity for photo editing, you probably don't need most of these. The solution is the hard to find studio manager, which you can access by clicking the three dots at the right of the studio bar. From here, you can hide any studio that you don't use. But this could cause confusion for new users who can't understand why their interface doesn't look like what they see in a video. Or you could find that you struggle to locate a studio only to discover that it's been hidden and you'd forgotten you'd done that. But these problems could get worse because we now have the option to create our own studios and include elements from others. So why create all these options that confuse users? 
My best guess is that it's a solution to a problem of merging three powerful complex applications into one. Affinity needed to give experienced users a way to customize the software so that it remains efficient and usable. Without that flexibility, the interface becomes cluttered and much, much slower to work with. If that's the problem they were solving, it does raise another question. Why merge three well-designed applications into one? I think the answer lies in keeping maintenance and development costs as low as possible. And that's possibly being driven by the next big change I want to discuss, the move to a freemium model. This is where you offer a free application, but then sell premium services on top of it. Companies like Blackmagic have done this very successfully with their DaVinci Resolve software. Now we see Canva offering a subscription service that extends the free Affinity software to include generative AI. If you're a photographer and not interested in generative AI, you don't need to pay for the Canva AI subscription. But that's where things could start to get a little ugly, which I'll come back to in a moment. First though, I want to look at two new features that promise a lot, but which I think fall into the bad category. These are the Adjustment Brush and the Filter Brush, both of which you'll find in the Tools palette. Let's look at the Adjustment Brush and I'll explain what I don't like. When I select the Adjustment Brush, I can choose the type of adjustment from the Affinity Toolbar. Let's pick a Levels Adjustment. Now I can paint on the image where I want to make the adjustment, except I can't yet see what type of adjustment I'm making other than Levels. The only clue is that the brush preview darkens parts of the image as I move it around. Then, when I click and paint with the adjustment brush, a levels dialog appears showing the adjustments being applied. I don't think that this is very helpful. It could have been improved by including a second drop down to select a preset in the toolbar. Affinity already has these presets in the adjustments panel, so why not reuse them here? But that's not my main problem with this brush. The real issue is the mask it produces. Look in the Layers panel and you'll see the new Levels layer that the Adjustment Brush added. Then attached directly to the Adjustment layer is the mask. This is a feature that I've always disliked about Affinity Photo. Why attach mask directly to Adjustment layers when there's a flexible and powerful masking system already available? If we want to reset a mask like this, it's not easy to do, and it can't be removed and replaced. This could have been avoided by simply adding a regular mask to the layer and having the brush paint on that instead. Then we could easily modify, duplicate, delete, or even move the mask to use with other layers. And these same problems exist with the filter brush as well. But I suspect I'm no straying into the ugly category, so let's move on to that next. The first concern I have is that, as a long-time Affinity user, I feel misled. When Canva purchased the Affinity Suite, they issued a press release saying they wouldn't move to a subscription model. To some extent, they've been good to their word. The software is now free, except for the Canva AI tools. If you want those, they're subscription only. But if we pause for a moment and look at the best tools other companies have produced, many of them rely on AI. Artificial intelligence is now being used for tasks like sharpening, noise reduction and upscaling, producing much better results with far less effort. And if we look at Adobe, their generative AI tools have become essential for tasks like removing unwanted objects and repairing old images. My concern is that the new freemium model for Affinity could limit future development. We may start to see the best tools and innovations available only through the Canva AI subscription. I'm hoping I'm wrong, but it's something we should watch carefully for. And if you agree with any of my concerns, please take a moment to share this video with other Affinity users. Now, there's one final thing that I want to mention in the ugly category. I think the new menu system deserves a special award. In my opinion, it makes the software unnecessarily difficult to navigate and much slower to use. If you're having the same problem as me, you might want to invest some time in setting up keyboard shortcuts. Fortunately, we can still modify these in the new software just as we did before. To find out how to do that, watch this video next. Thanks for watching today and I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon in the next one.